is uh, Lorena Wolfer, who is an artist and cultural activist and teacher. She has presented her work in Mexico and intercontinentally, and has conducted classes, workshops, and lectures at dozens of art spaces, museums, universities, and institutions. Her writings have been published in magazines, newspapers, and books, and as an independent contemporary arts promoter, she has organized and curated numerous exhibits and artistic events. She has also created and conducted cultural television and radio shows. She is co-founder and director of Ex Teresa Arte Alternativo of the National Institute of Fine Arts, and she has served as coordinator of many other cultural programs as well. Lorena is the recipient of the Art Breaker Award for Social Impact and the Commended Artist of Freedom to Create Award, as well as other awards and major grants. She describes her art as, quote, an ongoing site for enunciation and resistance at the intersection between art, activism, and feminism. And she has said that her projects are, and I'm quoting, produced within an inventive arena that underlines the pertinence of experimental languages and displaces the border between so-called high and low culture. She understands her work as, quote, a stage for the voices, representations, and narratives of others that articulates cultural practices based on respect and equality. A recent New York Times article stated that in her performance art, quote, Wolfer continues to embody the body politic through her own body while examining who is implicated in powerful, overlapping, and unjust economic systems. So please join me now in welcoming Lorena Wolfer to speak on citizen affects, affecto ciudadanos. Um, good evening, and thanks so much for being here. I want to start by thanking Jennifer Tversky, who has made this possible, um, as well as my prior visit to um, UCSB. I want to thank Susan, Alan, Aaron, and everybody else um, behind this conference. So, um, Susan was asking me how you, it is that you say afectos ciudadanos with an X. Um, I'm just going to start out by saying that that's a strategy that we have adopted to not speak in masculine in Spanish. So we do say afecto ciudadanos, even though there's a symbolic X there. In 2015, Berta, an art student from Iguala, Guerrero, contacted me seeking help with her thesis. As we spoke over the phone, she told me how she felt living in the city where the 43 normalista students from Ayotzinapa had been forcibly confronted and then disappeared five month, months earlier, with the confirmed direct involvement of the local, state, and federal police forces and that of the military. She described feeling desolate, enraged, and insecure in what she now referred to as a ghost town, where the streets emptied out every day as soon as the sun started setting. She also argued that with the normalist, while the Normalista students continued to occupy every possible front page of national and international newspapers, Iguala had been completely forgotten, and nobody seemed to care about how these events had changed the lives of the people who lived there. They had changed them for good. As she searched for the precise words that could illustrate her emotional state, I knew I had to find ways of publicly circulating how she and other Iguala residents were feeling. By then, I had been working with testimonies for many years. They had been the backbone for Expuestas Registros Públicos, Post public um, records, a long-term participatory cultural interventions project that I produced between 2008 and 2015, <clears throat> centered on violence against women, mainly in Mexico. However, I had never collected testimonies that solely addressed the feelings and affects elicited by a particular political event, phenomenon, or reality. I asked Berta if she would be willing to approach people in her hometown to ask how and what they felt, and she accepted. However, this proved to be a difficult task since, in her own words, and I quote, for several years we have known that we are not to talk to anyone, except for family members or people in whom we have extreme confidence about these issues, because there are halcones, hawks, spies for drug trafficking and or organized um, crime organizations, everywhere, and you never know if the person next to you is involved in drug trafficking or if the lines, and this is the phone lines, have been intervened. 
Because of this, there is even less talk after what just happened, referring to the um, disappearance of the Ayotzinapa students. Berta realized that she could only create safe listening spaces with relatives and close acquaintances and resolved to approach them only. Distributed mainly through social media in February 2015, these are some of the affects gathered by Berta for Testimonios de Iguala, de Iguala Testimonies. Siento mucha impotencia, pues no te queda más que solo mirar y callar. I feel a lot of impotence because all you can do is observe and shut up, anonymous. Miedo de salir, de hablar, de lo que escuchas, de lo que llegas a ver en las calles, de las balaceras. Fear of going out, of talking, of what you hear, of what you see on the streets, of the shootings, anonymous. Siento coraje porque no podemos hacer nada, porque nos ataron de las manos y porque truncan muchas cosas de la vida común. I feel rage because there is nothing we can do, because they tied us by the hands, and because they destroyed many things in our common life. Rosa, 29 years old. While working on this intervention, I discovered the unparalleled power of affects as political statements. Unlike so-called objective facts and data, they cannot be contested by anyone at, a, at, at any moment. When people's emotional and effective responses and interactions are made public, they offer a unique window into the positions they have been forced to occupy within certain political events, structures, or realities. In this sense, the project subscribes to the long-standing feminist tradition of understanding subjective experiences as legitimate forms of knowledge, and of publicly articulating them as a strategy to reveal the political structures that shape them and that conform them. Afecto Ciudadanos, Citizen Affects was born out of Testimonios de Iguala and soon became an investigation into the affects that cross, regulate, and define women, LGBTQIA plus identified individuals, and other non-normative and dissident persons in our interaction with others and with the power structures that surround and legislate us. In tune with the understanding of affects as cultural practices put forth by Sarah Ahmed, my intention has been to make them visible and intelligible through artworks produced and presented mainly in public settings. The project draws upon the idea that displaying these affects publicly validates the events that prompted them and can therefore serve as a form of reparation. In Mexico, a country where human rights violations are often made invisible by the state that should be investigating them, the recognition of violation in itself often operates as a first form of reparation. Using the city to reveal these emotions in the same spaces where they actually take place can also bring together people and communities that wouldn't gather otherwise in the recognition of shared feelings, emotions, and experiences. The process behind Afecto Ciudadanos entails closely working with a group of local collaborators responsible for collecting testimonies in each of the cities where I have produced it. Because many people are justifiably afraid of voicing their feelings, safe listening spaces need to be procured and participants are encouraged to sign their testimonies only with their first name and age or with an alias. After a period of gathering <clears throat> is over, I carefully analyze the testimonies to select the most powerful and revealing effective depictions. I never edit or intervene them and instead simply choose short sentences from longer testimonies because I believe they should be made public in the exact way in which they were phrased. Finally, I design a strategy for publicly displaying them, usually through stickers, posters, placards, and even billboards that are exhibited in specific public spaces or distributed virtually online. Working with representations, statements, and testimonies, the project has addressed how affects are constituted, experienced, and labeled in the context of specific political breakpoints. One such great point was when Alessa Flores, Paola Ledesma, and other trans women were murdered in Mexico City in 2016 as a direct result of the escalating force of conservative factions crystallized in organizations such as the Frente Nacional por la Familia, National Front for Family, that had recently orchestrated massively attended street protests that had not been seen um, ever throughout the country in response to Enrique Peña Nieto's initiative to legalize gay marriage nationally. In this context, Afecto Ciudadanos became an emotional cartography that revealed how trans women were feeling in their own city at that precise moment. Por todo lo que ha sucedido, por el asesinato de mi amiga Alessa, me siento inconsolable, triste, enojada, sin esperanza. 
Me siento rodeada, oprimida por la ignorancia y el odio, subrayada, señalada, estigmatizada, incomprendida, rodeada de hipócritas, de cobardes, de abominable injusticia. Because of everything that has happened, because of the murder of my friend Alessa, I feel inconsolable, sad, angry, hopeless. I feel surrounded, oppressed by ignorance and hatred, pointed at, stigmatized, misunderstood, surrounded by hypocrites, cowards, by abominable injustice. Marianne, unemployed trans woman, 32 years old. <clears throat> Me siento enojada con las autoridades de esta ciudad pseudo amigable. Me siento aterrada de que no puedo salir ni a la calle maquillada o con falda o con medias sin pensar que puedo ser la siguiente. Hago un llamado a las autoridades muy enérgico para que tomen cartas en el asunto y den seguridad a esta ciudad. I feel angry at the authorities of this pseudo-friendly city. I feel terrified that I can't go out on the street wearing makeup with a skirt or stockings without thinking that I could be next. I call on the authorities to take action on this matter and provide security for the city. Sara Magali, transgender woman, 39 years old. Estos días, al sentir la muerte obligada sentada al lado de mí y ver cómo se llevó a dos amigas tan queridas, me he sentido con mucho miedo. Siento miedo cuando cierro la puerta de mi casa y me doy cuenta que tal vez no la vuelva a abrir, no la vuelva eh, a abrir, eh, no la vuelva a poder abrir al día siguiente. These days, while feeling a forced death sitting next to me and seeing how it took two very dear friends of mine, I have felt very afraid. I feel scared when I close the door in my house and I realize that I, not, I might not be able to open it again since I could be the next one. Pia Garcia, La Sirena, trans woman, activist and feminist artist, 27 years old. In 2016, I produced Afecto Ciudadanos in Acapulco, a city on the Pacific coast of Mexico that used to be a beach haven, and in 2015 was declared the most dangerous city in the country and the fourth worldwide by the Mexican Consejo Ciudadano para la Seguridad Pública y la Justicia Penal. The project brought together the feelings prompted by a constant state of danger and emergency in a wide variety of people, including homeless children, sex workers, artists, and students, and was received with open arms in various colonias, neighborhoods, throughout the city. However, because of security concerns, for all the people involved in the project, triggered by the fact that participants had dared to speak out and name their affects, the project was canceled and our posters had, the billboards had to be taken down almost immediately. Soy vulnerable como cualquier mujer, me siento con mucho miedo porque uno no sabe si a la vuelta de la esquina se están balanceando. I'm vulnerable like any other woman. I feel afraid because you never know if there's a shooting when you turn a corner. Sarai, 28 years old. Salí a la calle, encontré a mis amigos, el mismo sentido tienen ellos y estamos aquí porque queremos que se hable más de cultura y menos de balas. I went out on the street, I found my friends, they share the same feelings, and we are here because we want to talk more about culture and less about bullets. Champi, 30 years old. He visto todo, no tengo miedo, tengo pánico. I have seen everything, I am not afraid, I am in a state of panic. Luis, 55 years old. I have narrowly addressed the above mentioned versions of Afecto Ciudadanos because I want to focus on two of the produced two of that I were that were produced, sorry, for for and with LGBTQIA plus communities within university settings. Mapping Descent that took place here at UCSB last year in April, and UNAM Diversa created for the National Autonomous University of Mexico, La UNAM, in Mexico City in December of that same year. My intention is to assess their impact and compare the process that each entailed with the involved communities, but also with the staff and university administrators, in order to speak about the reality of gay and queer people living in Mexico City today. The colossal differences between the two contexts in social, political, economic, and cultural terms and an endless list of other fronts are obvious. Even addressing the fact that both are public universities results in marked differences since our understanding of what public education means on both sides of the border differs dramatically. In terms of LGBTQIA rights, California, as you know much better than I do, 
has historically been viewed as one of the most liberal states in the US. In turn, in the last 15 years, Mexico City has become an island where sex same marriage and gender reassignment have become legal in 2006 and 2014, respectively, only to be met by a renewed force of conservative factions in the, in the other states around the country. The mapping dissent experience. Afecto Ciudadanos was produced by the LGBTQ Studies Minor, the Department of Feminist Studies, the Office of Student Affairs, and the Multicultural Center at UCSB as part of the Queer Hemispheres Radical Performance Series. When invited by Jennifer, <clears throat> shortly after Donald Trump had been elected president, I proposed a project as a public platform for Santa Barbara queer residents to voice how they were feeling and the ramifications of the election and what it entailed for them in the immediate future, but also in the long term. <clears throat> Jennifer and I engaged in dozens of conversations and interminable email exchanges <laughs> before even finding the right questions that participants would be asked to respond. In the end, we shifted from asking, how do you feel about having Donald Trump as president with his anti-LGBTQIA politics to, which is something that I asked of you um, earlier, what are the feelings in which you have or plan to respond queerly to his politics? Jennifer put together a fabulous group of 30 students, staff, and faculty, uh, scholars, who became testimony collectors. Because I only traveled to Santa Barbara for the public presentation of the project, my communication with the testimony collectors happened through Skype calls, in which we discussed how to approach possible participants and different strategies to create safe listening spaces with and for them. Over one more period, one month, one month period, they gathered a total of 69 testimonies from within the UCSB community, but also from other Santa Barbara residents. The testimony gifters, or givers as we came to call them, included Chicanas and Chicanos, Muslims, African Americans, Mexicans, Boricuas, Peruvians, and Iranians, among others who identify as lesbian, gay, queer, trans, bisexual, gender non-conforming, non-binary, and straight, and whose ages range from 14 to 50 seconds, 56 years old. Their testimonies respond to the post question from intersectional stances and tackle a number of different issues. Some participants focused on clearly expressing how they were feeling. I feel my lip curl back, my throat fills up, and the violence of this administration fills my body. It's in me, but I am not of it. I will vomit it out. Take the shit and scraps that come up and throw it in the face of those who have allowed this nightmare to happen. Lynn, 40 queer troublemaker. For many days in a row following the election, I wanted to kill myself before someone else did it for me. I feel unsafe here. Jen, grad student. As a person that identifies as trans, I understand what it feels like to be misunderstood a lot. I am also aware that this is past the point of misunderstanding. This is blatant arrogance. That is what's frightening the most, and for that man to be a representative of what America is and what it is to be living in America is disgraceful. Selena, 23, trans fluid, Chicana, Chicano studies. November 8, the day I realized that we, had been, we hadn't left the closet, the world had shoved us back in, then set it on fire. Jaime, 20, queer student. The day of the presidential election marks the day I broke my sobriety. His inauguration marks the day of my loss to my depression as I allowed for it to control me. Queer student 21. People of color and immigrants utter testimonies that also speak of Trump's politics regarding both groups and cultures. I've talked to people outside of California. I have taken up spaces with queer people of color. They're scared because they don't know what, it, what is going to happen. People like me are not supposed to be here. We don't make it out of our town. Raudel, the unique Chicanix queer nerd. The heightened assault on underprivileged bodies has required me to make visible and persistent my queer and Muslim and brown body, heart, and mind. It is purely political, a micro gesture. My data body is queer and cyborg. In a performance matrix, I disrupt the signal. I am angry, I am here, I am queer. We rise up together. Intersectional solidarity, love. Cyborg 45. 
<clears throat> in terms of my rights as a gay woman, I am so afraid of my expense more than Donald Trump. With Donald Trump, I'm afraid for my aunts and uncles who are undocumented, who could be deported. Got me 21, gay Peruvian woman, geography major. My response as a biracial queer person is to attempt to be stronger and louder, even though every cell in my body wants to retreat to a dark corner and wait it out. This is not the time to retreat. B, double major, double minor, son of an immigrant, 21. I shed tears the night of the election. I'll call myself C. I love theater. I graduated on the top 5% of my high school, and everything I have done and every obstacle I have overcome has been thanks to my parents, my undocu undocumented, beautiful parents. Finally, these testimonies document how the election served as a peculiar wake-up call, inciting people to take action and resist together through activist practices. If the darkest days come, I will not be the first to disappear and that terrifies me. So, to answer your question, my queer response to this election is to be of service. I will put my energy towards supporting my loved ones rather than wasting it on hate. We must be vigilant and look out for each other. That's the only way we won't disappear. Danny, 21, theater student. It's frustrating to see how much more we have to prove our humanity and how unwilling folks seem to be. Uneasy. The definition of what it means to be human is lost. We are not used to speaking about our feelings, pissed off, heartbreak, sadness, anger, helplessness. And also simultaneously, beauty, hopeful, resilient, powerful, strong. Because I'm seeing my community stand up to fight. Muy Mexican culture. To me, a queer response to the election of a prejudiced and polarizing person is not one of distress or overwhelming sadness. Much like queerness itself, I view this new era as an opportunity to fully unite and reignite the flames of resistance lit by so many queer people before us. This is our opportunity as people to fight for the change we want to see. Queer complacency will be the end of us. Gay County Government Employee. I am humbled to see how each community impacted by this administration has come together to support one another. In this time of tragedy, fear, and uncertainty, we are sticking together and educating one another about how to make a difference. And that is exactly what we need to move forward. <coughs> Paul, 26, photographic artist, Ventura, queer man. We can't assure each other that everything will be okay because with every oppressive action this administration perpetuates, it feels like they stabbed you in the wounds that haven't healed from past battles. But then I remember that this isn't new to us and that we know this place. Abby, queer staff member 22. The performative aspect of the project, as you've seen in the poster for this conference, until the second walk through campus alongside the organizers, the testimony collectors, and other allies for the placement of the red and black placards, placards containing the testimonies. Our collective walk, which had previously been rehearsed and choreographed, started out with only a dozen of us and grew as we moved through buildings and departments. As others joined us in, our collective action became even more robust and powerful. In the end, in an act of plural enunciation, we read each of the 66 selected testimonies on the steps of Stork Tower. The placards were then um, displayed for a month. Although the process behind the entire project was complex and required bringing together different departments at UCSB and negotiating between them, all impeccably handled by Jennifer, the concerns that came up mainly had to do with logistics about how and where the placards would be, would be placed. Not only did I not hear of anyone openly opposing the project, but the outright um, group that threatened to show up at the protest, to protest our peaceful and silent walk, never even showed up. I do have to say we're being protected by um, the Queers Against Fascism group here, which was wonderful, but they 
but this other group member did show up. The UNAM Diversa Experience. At the UNAM, Afectos Ciudadanos was produced by the Laboratorio Nacional Diversidades, National Laboratory for Diversities, launched in April 2017 at the Instituto de Investigaciones Jurídicas, the Legal Research Institute. The newly established laboratory was created by the Humanities Department to promote and disseminate a wide array of academic, social, and artistic projects focused on the panoply diverse communities that exist in Mexico today focusing on sex and gender diversity groups during its first year. Historically, the UNAM has been one of the most progressive institutions in the country, breeding, housing, and supporting left-wing movements of all colors and flavors, and consequently, the creation of the Laboratorio seemed like an organic response to the growing interest in gender studies and all things gender-related in Mexico and abroad. As one of the founding members of the Laboratorio, and admittedly the only artist, the only artist outsider in our team, otherwise conformed by scholars, I was in charge of introducing artistic, activist, interstitial practices as valid and essential platforms to make our diverse communities visible and contest the systems that oppress and discriminate us, something quite radical in that particular academic setting. Because of our focus on sex, gender, diverse communities for the first year, the initial question to ask was obviously how many people within the university were part of the LGBTQIA plus community and who they were. Unsurprisingly, these statistics did not exist. They had never been accounted for in the largest university in the country. The resulting information loophole that led me to steer Afecto Ciudadanos into operating as a platform for the public presentation of the members of, this, of these communities, where they could also share how they felt in three different domains. Their private spaces, uh, the university, and the city at large. Over a month, a group of six queer collaborators, led by fellow artist Mirna Roldan, visited the 15 university departments where over 100 careers are taught. 124 testimonies were gathered from students, faculty, and staff members that I eventually transformed into 108 placards and 20,000 stickers. This time, however, the placards were manufactured in seven different colors to form rainbows when displayed together. Together, the placards drew a multi-layered cartography in which some chose to overtly define and express their identities. I apparently didn't include that first, those first placards, but we'll move on to the second ones. Um, the following testimonies have nothing but praise for the UNAM, either because of what they found there or what they were, were able to accomplish within its classes and classrooms. La ENAP fue para mí una de las épocas más bellas de mi vida hasta ahora. Cuando llevaba apenas unos meses ahí, conocí personas entrañables que se convirtieron en la familia que yo escogí y a la fecha frecuento. The ENAP, which is the art school, now the FAD, Facultad de Artes y Diseño, was for me one of the most beautiful moments of my life until today. When I had been there only for a few months, I met endearing people who became my chosen family that I still see today. Josué Rodas. La universidad es un buen espacio para descubrir, descubrirte y abrir nuevos panoramas. The university is a good place to discover, discover yourself and over an open new landscape. Errante Estrella. Tal vez, si no hubiera llegado nunca a la UNAM y a Ciudad Universitaria, no sé si habría aceptado mi homosexualidad a esa edad o si, la había, o si lo habría hecho siquiera. Maybe it, if I had never come to the UNAM and to the university city, to campus, uh, I would have never accepted my homosexuality at that age, or maybe I wouldn't have done it at all. El puto que lo leyó, the faggot who read it, which is a common expression that you find, um, you know, el puto el que lo lea. Packet, whoever reads it on walls. This is um, one of the ways that 
one of the participants chose to sign their testimony. Como mujer trans, mi cotidianidad en la universidad es hasta cierto punto de relativa tranquilidad en relación a las dinámicas de género existentes. La universidad es de los espacios en donde más segura me siento respecto a la violencia contra personas trans que en otros puntos de la ciudad o fuera de la misma. As a trans woman, my everyday life in the university is, to a certain degree, relatively peaceful concerning the existing gender dynamics. The university is one of the spaces where I feel most secure in regards to violence against transgender people than in other places in the city or outside of it. Maclea. Creo que la UNAM es un espacio triste y feo, que hay muchas violencias dentro y fuera del salón de clase, y tengo una sensación permanente de acoso. On the other side of the spectrum, these following testimonies address acts of discrimination and violence experienced at the UNAM. I think the UNAM is a sad and ugly space, that there are many forms of violence inside and outside of the classrooms. I live with a permanent feeling of harassment, rata feminista, feminist rat. Si bien trato de ser una lesbiana visible, en espacios libres como las islas procuro más nuestra seguridad pues no sabemos el potencial riesgo de misoginia y de lesbofobia. Sé que las autoridades de la UNAM no están para auxiliarnos. Although I try to be a visible lesbian in open spaces such as las islas, which is kind of like the main public space at the UNAM, I procure our safety more because we know we are potentially at risk for misogyny and lesbofobia. I know that the authorities at the UNAM are not here to help us with this. Tanto en las clases como en todo el discurso institucional que reviste la universidad, letreros, propaganda, etc., domina la heterosexualidad obligatoria, maquillada de apertura y discurso rosa de género. In classes as well as all the institutional discourses in the university, science, advertisements, etc., are dominated by obligatory, heter by obligatory heterosexuality disguised as aperture and a pink gender discourse. Maria Panocha, Maria Kant. En la UNAM me siento fuera de lugar, discriminada, acosada, juzgada, señalada, oprimida por una cotidianidad heteronormada, misógina y patriarcal. At the UNAM, I feel out of place, discriminated against, harassed, judged, singled out, oppressed by, heteronorm by a heteronormative, misogynistic, and patriarchal daily life. Tu puta madre, your fucking mother. <laughs> the following testimonies reveal how insecure the city of Mexico is for people uh, who identify as LGBTQIA every day. Sé que debo cuidarme. Vivo en el Estado de México y estoy consciente de que mi condición de mujer y mujer diversa puede ponerme en escenarios donde mi fuerza de espíritu no me ayudará con un feminicida. I know that I must take care of myself, I live in the state of Mexico, and I am aware that my condition as a woman, and a diverse woman, can put me in scenarios where my strength of spirit will not help me with a femicide. I don't know how you translate femicida, but, you know. Katia Barbona Rodriguez. Intento crear todas las estrategias de reafirmación personal y acompañamiento colectivo posibles para seguir ocupando los espacios públicos de noche. Es sin duda la injusticia más grande que existe entre los hombres y las mujeres. El terror impreso en la piel y el enojo que genera en mí no sentirme igual de libre. I try to create all the possible strategies for personal reaffirmation and collective accompaniment to continue occupying public spaces at night. It is undoubtedly the greatest injustice that exists between men and women. The terror imprinted on our skin and the anger of not feeling equally free generates in me. La hija de la luna, the daughter of the moon. Me siento orgullosa de ser parte de las personas que rompen con el binario de género y poder expresar esa ruptura simplemente caminando por la calle, aunque eso implique en algunas ocasiones ser víctima de distintos tipos de agresiones impulsadas por miedo a lo desconocido o a lo que no se comprende. I feel proud to be part of the people who break with the gender binary and being able to express that rupture simply by walking down the street, even if it means at times being a victim of different types of aggression driven by fear of the unknown or of what is not understood. Uri. En general considero la Ciudad de México una ciudad insegura para todas las personas. Y para las personas de la diversidad y en específico mujeres trans, 
la considero aún más peligrosa por lo que igual hay que tener ciertos cuidados. En general, I consider Mexico City an insecure city for all people, and for diverse people, and specifically transgender women, I consider it even more dangerous, so one still has to be careful. Lastly, intimate and family and community relationships are addressed in these testimonies. En mis espacios afectivos y las comunidades en las que elijo estar, me siento arropada y fuerte. En mi familia y en la sociedad es la misma basura. In my affective spaces and in the communities in which I choose to be, I feel sheltered and strong. In my family and in society, it is the same garbage. Tu puta madre and your fucking mother. Mi familia y mis amigas me apoyan y me acompañan desde mi transición. My family and my friends support me and accompany me since my transition. Anonymous. En los espacios íntimos he encontrado una red sexoafectiva en la que los afectos forman parte de una forma de desaprendizaje y autocrítica a las violencias relacionales cotidianas. In my intimate, in intimate spaces I have found a sex-effective network in which affects are part of a form of unlearning and self-criticism to everyday relational violence. Mirmix, la ficha maligna, the malignant card. En mis espacios afectivos íntimos me siento libre y segura. Tengo un novio y una novia a los cuales quiero infinitamente porque juntos aprendemos cómo hacerlo. In my intimate emotional spaces I feel safe, I feel free and safe. I have a boyfriend and a girlfriend whom I love infinitely because together we are learning how to do it. Uri. Unam Diversa was supposed to be exhibited in Las Islas, the Green Islands at the center of the university, surrounded by rectoria, the dean's office, the main library, and a number of faculties, which constitutes the main public space where thousands gather daily. However, only a few days before its announced public presentation in mid-October, I was instructed to put it on hold until further notice. What followed were a number of Kafkaesque meetings with high-ranking of university officials, who first asked that I produce a campaign to contextualize the project beforehand and prepare audiences, then suggested that we show it at the Centro Cultural Universitario del Cultural Center. Instead, and even shuffled ideas about taking it to two of the university's off-campus museums, the Museo Universitario del Chopo and the Centro Cultural Tatelor. Many arguments were brought forth that the families that wander through Las Islas on weekends are not ready and should not be exposed to the project, that I ask participants to change their AL aliases to less offensive ones, <laughs> and that the intervention was perhaps best suited for the art folks at the Centro Cultural, but not so much for the families with children at Las Islas. Two weeks before the school year ended, the same officials finally concluded the intervention should be exhibited for two weeks at El Paseo de las Esculturas, the sculpture passage, a deserted path that goes from the Centro Cultural to the Espacio Escultorico, where students either go to make out or you get left. My impression is that the decision to finally show it in that particular location served two purposes. To actually go through with the exhibition that had been promised to the laboratorio's main sponsor, Conacyt, at the time when the yearly reports were to be handed in, but to do so in a space where no one would see it. The intervention, or solitary rainbows as we started calling them, um, garnered no impact whatsoever. In the context of the UNAM, the fact that the words and feelings of LGBTQIA plus individuals in the first project devoted to this community in the entire university had to be hidden, hidden away is inadmissible and demands a careful analysis. After much thought, I'm sure that there are various reasons behind the censorship of UNAM Diversa. The first has to do with the fact that Laboratorio does not operate from a genuine political stance that translates into the effective articulation and defense of its projects. At UCSB, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, <clears throat> different departments came together for this project, as I'm sure they've done before, and will do so again in the future. This not only constitutes a collaboration in practical terms, but more importantly, it shapes an intersectional political space constituted by each and every one of the political forces that were already in place within these departments. In other words, the laboratorio lacks a political weight that I imagine probably defines a feminist or the Chicana and Chicana departments here. So 
Secondly, for years, many of us have argued that in Mexico, more money and infrastructure is allocated to projects, policies, and programs that essentially simulate they tackle the problems for which they're, where they were created than to others that actually do accomplish that task. This is true for the rights of virtually all discriminated and marginalized groups, from LGBTQIA plus communities to women or indigenous populations. As lawyer Andrea Medina Rosas affirms, the state and its authorities have clear obligations to guarantee certain rights. The authorities formally comply with those obligations by creating laws and institutions, spending money, and so on. However, their actions never translate into effective means for citizens to truly exercise those very rights. The Mexico City Constitution, we've become a state, and we're no longer a federal entity. Created in February of last year um, as one of the main steps for the city to become a state independent of the federal government, acknowledges and protects the rights of LGBTQ persons to a life free of violence and discrimination, and recognizes our families with or without children. Two years before, the city had been declared una ciudad amigable LGBTTI, a gay-friendly city defined as follows. Being a friendly city means it guarantees a full exercise of human rights through the defense and consolidation of the rights of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, transvestite, transgender, and intersex community, and the application of public policies, legal security, access to justice, and due process. A friendly city recognizes that there are discriminatory behaviors among its inhabitants in order to respond to the social phenomenon It legislates and articulates government actions that promote inclusion and eliminate, eliminate discourage discrimination. In writing, as Sajak was also talking about before, our constitutions, articles, and the gay-friendly ordinance sound wonderful. But the problem, as Medina points out, has to do with their enactment and effects. It has been widely reported that 2017 was the most violent year in Mexico in the last 20 years. Yet only 9% of the crimes committed in the country are punished, according to the Institute for Economics and Peace. Mexico today occupies the second place worldwide for hate crimes, following Brazil in the second the first place. Discrimination and hate crimes due to gender and orientation and gender identity have continued, and in some cases have even increased. Although some changes to the legislation in Mexico City and the presidential decree for the National Day for the Fight Against Homophobia every May 17th represent huge steps, they do not seem to make substantial progress in building a culture of respect, claims Jaime Rochin, president for the Comisión Ejecutiva de Atención a Víctimas. This um, co Committee for the Attention of victims, victims is one of the new institutions created by the government itself, supposedly, to investigate um, the acts committed against these victims and protect them. In Mexico City, the second Encuesta sobre Discriminación, the survey on discrimination, conducted by the Consejo para Prevenir y Eliminar la Discriminación de la Ciudad de México, the Council for the Prevention and Elimination of Discrimination in Mexico City from 2017, revealed that LGBTQIA individuals are the second most discriminated against group in the city. If we look at the censorship of UNAM viewers in this context, it becomes clear that the UNAM, far from being watched what Jacques Derrida termed the university without condition, has become another institution complicit with the simulation of the state. What is most dramatic is that the laboratorio that was only recently established and was supposed to be un espacio ganado, a concrete space, ended up becoming another organization that only professes to respect and celebrate diverse and dissident communities, but ends up being complicit to them being hidden away and kept from the public. What are we to do in the face of this reality? How can we counter normalized forms of violence when those in charge of observing and implementing the laws designed to guarantee our, our rights, which constitute obligations, are the first to disobey or challenge them? The only possible answer is to refuse to work with those institutions and find other spaces, other forms, other allies, yet again. And quoting one of the testimonies from Mapping Descent, with every repressive action this administration perpetuates, it feels like they stabbed you in the wounds that haven't healed from past battles. But then I remember that this isn't new to us, that we know this place. And yes, we do know this place, and we also know how to fight back. Thank you so much.